Hello and welcome to this Dungeon Fog tutorial. We're going to be looking at the Select tool today. The Select tool is arguably one of the most powerful tools that you will be using within Dungeon Fog, and you'll be coming back to it on multiple occasions. The Select tool allows us to left click anywhere on our map and automatically see all of the information that is pertinent to this particular level. For example, we can see currently that the level is an unnamed level. I like to always name my level, so I left click and drag over the words unnamed level and then type in my own name. This could be as simple as ground level. I then press enter to complete the action. Now that we've called it ground level, and we can see this both here in the level drop down options as well as in the name of this particular level, we can start to move forward. We have the option of our floor. What type of basic texture do we want our floor to have? If I left click on the texture itself, it brings up the Dungeon Fog Asset Manager and I can see all of the textures that are available to me from Dungeon Fog. And if I use this drop down menu, I can see any textures that I might have created myself or added to my own collections. For now, though, we're going to simply select, let's say, Ancient Ruins. Notice how it automatically changes the floor to the Ancient Ruins texture. As with all of Dungeon Fog's props, assets and textures, we have some very basic controls which they all share. We have rotation, we have scaling, and then we have the colorization or color changing tools available to us. By changing the rotation of the map, you will notice that these squares will change alignment. For now, I'm very quickly going to just hide the grid so we can see the pattern change direction. If I change scaling to 25, you'll notice that it's now offset by 25 degrees from the north. This allows us to create some very dynamic textures moving through our entire buildings. Once again, these tools are usable in all of the Dungeon Fog assets that we have access to. Let's default that back to zero, shall we? Now I'm going to change the scaling. If I make the scaling smaller, so I make it 50%, the map will appear huge, as the tiling is now significantly increased, making these tiles look as if they're smaller and thus the map larger. If I increase the map scaling to say 300%, the map will now look significantly smaller as the tiling is significantly larger, creating this sense that we're closer to the space and that the space is not as big as we first thought. I'm going to default back to 100 Playing with scaling and rotation can be a really powerful way to make your maps stand out and truly play around with a sense of depth as well as a differing sense of scale. Finally, when we look at the change color options, we have two options, change colors or colorize. Change color means that whatever colors are in the particular texture that we're wanting to manipulate, the colors will be changed relative to one another. If I colorize, it simply erases all of the color from the existing texture and replaces it with a color that I so choose. Let me show you how. Under change color, the circle is towards the change color option. If I change, say, the slider bar, I can left click and drag or I can just left click on the color slider bar. If I make it more green in hue, it changes everything but slightly green, depending on what the original color of the texture was. If I undo that, and I now go to Colorize, I can change it to green, it's now just a solid green. There's no subtlety, there's no manipulation of the original color of the texture, it's now just green. Whichever option I choose, I can control the actual color that the map changes to, I can control the amount of, or the intensity of the color, the saturation of the color, dropping it all the way down to gray if I really desire it to be a flat gray. I can then also control the lightness or the lumen level, if you so like, making it lighter or making it darker. Again, changing all of these options allow us to create some truly unique maps and turns every single texture that we have into a thousand options for us to use. If we want all of these numbers to default back to zero, it's as easy as clicking change color and then everything is set back to zero. If we want our floor color to perhaps be just a flat color, we don't want to use a texture. We can then in the top right hand corner select color and that brings up a standard color wheel. We can now choose to have our texture being a flat color rather than being a texture. 
You could use this for a myriad of purposes, and once again, you have the same controls as you normally do in terms of changing your colorization from dark to light, from saturated or unsaturated to saturated, and then playing around with the different colors. Alternatively, we can go back to texture and select a texture that we particularly like. Let's go with clustered bleached bones. Now here is an example of where we might want to change our scaling. The detailed pattern is almost overbearing. If I change that to 300%, we can now start to see its skulls and bones. And bearing in mind each of these grids is five foot space, that makes that skull probably one and a half foot in diameter. Might be a little bit big, but that's the joy of Dungeon Fog. We can change and adjust and manipulate to our heart's content. Once we're done with the floor texture, we simply click on the word floor and that decompresses the bar back down to our simple interface. We have the option of showing the stage or not showing the stage. When we hide the stage, we get to see the layer below. Here is something that I did earlier on. This is useful if we want to align stairwells, staircases, secret doors, secret trap doors with the level below, or if we just want to see what we were doing in the level below, we can simply hide or show the stage. Showing the grid does pretty much the same thing in terms of revealing the grid or hiding the grid, depending on which option we choose. Note that if we don't show the grid, we lose various options. If we do show the grid, we get the ability to manipulate that grid as we so choose by using the style option. This is that same drop down that we had at the beginning when we were setting up the map. We can now change that to dotted rectangle, dots perhaps, that certainly doesn't work here. We could change it to pluses, we could change it to hexagons, we could change it to an isometric view if we so desired. All of these options are available to us and we're not fixed to any of them right up until we export the map. We then have the option for inverted. In this instance, I'm going to create a very simple room so that you can see the effect. Once I have created my room, I go back to my select tool and now when I click on inverted, the grid changes so that it is visible over the map regardless of the texture of the map. The grid on the outside, where the texture is predominantly grey, has now changed to a dark black colour. The area over the grey walls has changed to a lighter colour, and the area over the muddy brown tiles has changed to a light grey. This allows us to see the grid at all times, making sure that regardless of what our map looks like, we can still see that grid. We do have an option here, underneath the word inverted, where we can make the map lighter, in other words less visible, or more visible. Again, playing around with settings as we so desire. I'm going to set the map back now to the usual grid view. I have a color option, and once again, if I left click on that, it brings up my color wheel, and I have all of the usual color value adjustments that I might need. I can change the grid to being dark. Notice how it's now visible over the light areas, but not so visible over the darker areas, hence the inverted option. I can change the grid's color, I might want it to be more of this orange color. Again, I can change the opacity of the grid to make it less or more visible, depending on what I need. I'm going to make it back to black. At a 39% opacity, I can now see pretty much what's going on. Once again, if I select the word color, it will drop the menus down to their usual state. I then have control over my map size. This is currently the default 70, which we selected when we were creating the map. I can increase this or decrease this as I so desire. The distance metric. This is used for calculating real world distances, and we're going to touch more on this when we're actually creating a room. Suffice it to say that the distance metric is usually disabled. We can select the drop-down menu to change that to exact, which is Euclidean distance. Or perhaps we prefer to use 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons system, which is one-to-one. -one. Alternatively, we could use Pathfinder or 3.5 edition Dungeons & Dragons at 1.2, or we could go Manhattan style, which is X plus Y. I'll explain more about these in the drawing room tutorial. We then have real-world units, which we can once again select, and that states that each square is equal to 5 feet. Our drop-down menu allows us to change that to inches, to miles, to meters, kilometers, or to keep it in feet. This is really useful if you're trying to do a to-scale drawing where you have exact measurements. 
Finally, under the Select tool, we have the Blueprint. This is an option to either not show it or to show it. There are a lot of options that go into this, which will be covered in another video. That concludes this tutorial on the Select tool. Find more tutorials on all of the other tools and how to create amazing maps here on Dungeon Fog. Until next time, happy map making!